figure it out that it's a little different here? Or? The 9 o'clock uh, group is still having a tough time figuring out what happened. They, with the 9 o'clock peeps, they, they, they haven't had as much sleep as all of you. And so that's all right. That's all right. Good morning, everyone. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter number 9. We'll get into the Word of God here and, uh, and have a neat time. Last night we had our dinner theater. And uh, the murder mystery, we found out that Boris was the murderer, a la, a.k.a. Gabe Lutz. The nicest guy. The whole church, and they picked him as the murderer? Oh, my gosh. Should have been Rick Dawson. Gosh. Oh, wait a minute. He's a nice guy, too, so that's all right. Oh. We just had a sweet time in fellowship and uh, friendship and relationship and uh, truly just sitting amongst one another and the tables and, and uh, having just a great time. There is a few wonderful tables up in the front here. This is, we have breakfast coming in at 11.15 for the front three tables. And so, uh, yeah, there you go. There'll be locks and bagels, so if you're Jewish, you're going to be all right. Those of you who know what locks are, then you'll, I don't know, you'll be okay. But sometimes the nose starts running. Praise the Lord. To me, it was uh, just a successful time in the Lord Jesus Christ. And to him be the glory, we had an opportunity to hear eight different thespians uh, deny their, uh, their part in the murder. They all were guilty as far as we were concerned at our table. Wherever Mason and, and uh, those guys are, we, we decided they're all guilty. Put them all in jail. But uh, it turned out to be a sweet time again of, of uh, just a, it's a great time to reach out to people and love on one another and just have a, the meal was great, the food was wonderful, and the, just the way things went. Thank you, Mike and Amy Meyer, and uh, thank you, team in the back. Uh, the audio and technical people that did such a great job and everything and, and uh, made sure that all the things that are important went well and uh, at the end we had the opportunity to uh, uh, partake in a uh, tremendous gospel message in a few minutes presenting uh, the gospel, a mystery of the Lord Jesus Christ, which tied together, of course, beautifully in the spirit for the murder mystery. So uh, thank you, Lord, for a great time to reach out to our, our community, and we'll continue to do things like that as God has allowed us to do mission work. We are in the midst of uh, really a time where doing missions is, is uh, become, it is part of our church ministry, and it's getting deeper and more ingrained. Many of you are on personal mission, and you ought to be the mission work of an Acts 1-8 church is that every individual would go, that they would go in the power of the Holy Spirit of God and be Jesus' witnesses of the gospel message. And so last night was a corporate gathering time, but you and I all have an individual responsibility to go to other people in the, the Matthew 28 mandate and commandment and commission from the Lord continues to be our desire. We continue to reach people for Christ and baptize them and then see them uh, be discipled and grow in the Word of God and then serve. And, and maybe one of the areas in which they serve is in a dinner theater setting. Of course, having everybody warmed up to the place of, wow, I really enjoy being in that church building today. And of course, that led to us to say, hey, let's leave the tables down. Uh, we thought we were going to have some pulled pork sandwiches for breakfast this morning, but I didn't communicate properly. But... But no, it's a, it's a wonderful time. We will not do this again, but we might. So try and figure that out. It'll be like being in Ecclesiastes. That's the way our study is. We have been in Ecclesiastes for a few months, and uh, I know that um, we're getting close to the end. As I mentioned last week, I'm pretty good at math. If you're in chapter 8, and then you're in chapter 9, and there's only 12 chapters, you're getting close. Our theme verse in this study has been found out of, and is found out of, the first chapter, verse number 13, where it speaks of Solomon's heart 
toward the assignment that he's put upon himself. A man that uh, was the king over the nation of Israel for 40 years. And we're going to speak of his end today and uh, how uh, he came to an end and died, of course. And that will tie together, of course, to our message in chapter number 9. As I was standing there singing, I'm going, why in the world did I... Whew, what God had led us to preach through, and I already have made it, you already made it through one message. We'll see how this goes, but it really is the truth of the Word of God that we're teaching in one of the places and parts of it from our theme verse is how we search things out. We search for purpose in everything, and Solomon did. He gave his heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. I mention this each week that you know that under heaven, under the sun, is a phrase that is found in the book of Ecclesiastes. Unfortunately for so many people, their whole life is lived under the sun. It's not eternally based. Even the born-again believer finds themselves kind of compacted down, has put their ceiling on God right about here, when the ceiling on God is eternity. And you and I forget that we are to live in a heavenly mindset. In an eternal mindset, Solomon was not living that way. So, when he gave his heart to search and to seek out the things of God and consider everything under the sun, what happened? In the second half of the verse, it says it was a sore travail. This is a sore travail that God has given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. That's kind of the way this study in Ecclesiastes goes, which is, hey, Solomon, there's a God in heaven that you know that you have known, but yet your relationship has become distant from him. And so now when you're starting to read, I'm starting to write, and of course the accounting of Ecclesiastes is that he's the preacher. In chapter number one, and he's gathered everybody together. And in this ecclesia, this gathering, he is the one that is speaking. And of course it is a man who is wrestling with himself. It's like he's talking to himself trying to sort out and, and search out and seek out the purposes of this life without interjecting God in all of it, and not just interjecting him, but keeping God in the forefront. We see in chapter number 12, we'll get there, of course, in three weeks, that he does recognize the creator. He does talk of how the whole conclusion of man is to... Uh, Keep his commandments, God, keep God's commandments. Uh, that's the whole duty of man. And he does mention and does put that in, but there really is no accounting in Scripture of him saying, I repent. I repent of my life away from the Lord. I repent of my brokenness away from God. I repent of my hard heart. And so he's in a place where he's searching out things. But our study is named this for one simple reason, believers in church. We're to search for God's purpose in things. We're to search for purpose in everything. To find out if this is what God's supposed, I'm supposed to be part of this because God's in it. Or I'm supposed to look at it and go, yeah, God's not in this thing. I, I don't see where God has anything to do with it. How do you know that? It has to line up with Scripture. It has to line up with the Word of God. Well, I don't know if it does. Well, call the office and talk to Dwayne, Bobby, and Brian. I'm usually sleeping during the day, and I will not be available for you. Just kidding. You can call and ask questions. You can call and sit down with a pastor. You can call and sit down with someone who's a disciple maker. You can call, call and say, hey, could I get somebody? It might be the most important phone call you make this week if you decide, hey, I'm going to call the church and leave a message, have somebody get back to me. If you grab my business card that's in the lobby, or you ask one of the people that work at the Info Hub area, say, hey, I need to have the contact information of the pastor. I want to ask him a question because I need to search something out. I don't know the purpose of a matter. And I promise you, within a day or two, you'll get a response either from me or one of our pastors here or someone that has the spiritual maturity to walk you through maybe something that Solomon has said. Something that has come up in your scripture reading. Something that's come up in your faith walk, in your hunt. And you're going, gosh, I need to sort something out. There's problems everywhere. And by the way, Solomon just lays them all out. He declares problems. He discusses the problems. He decides life and the problems and all of them. And today in chapter number 9... We're going to get into a problem, which is really not a problem, but it's a problem 
in its essence, but it's a reality in life. I am inevitable. You say, that's awful arrogant of you, pastor. You are inevitable? Well, I'll explain it to you here in a moment. The word inevitable, it simply means this. Sure to happen. Incapable of being avoided or evaded. It's certain. It's inescapable. So what is inevitable? Well, maybe this will click something for you when you see the screen. Now, that might be an image that someone might use on a profile somewhere. <laughs> but after I explain something to him today, he might change his mind. I don't know. Maybe he already knows this. The meaning of Thanos. You watch these movies sometimes. Now, how many of you have not seen the movie with the marbles and the marbles and the fountain? Th a few of you. You're not missing anything. Don't worry about it. The kids are crazy, though, and I'm a kid, so. The meaning of Thanos is immortal. But let me go further with this. Because if you consider his statement, his statement isn't about how he's immortal or how he's eternal. He's saying something about his inevitability. And that when he shows up, death is coming. Watch the movie. Watch all of his movies. Now let me give you a little bit of a background from the Greek mytholo mythological setting. Thanos, the Mad Titan, has one of the most threatening names in the Marvel comics. In Greek, the name Thanos is a short form of the personal name Athanasios, which means immortal. The name, however, is derived from the name Thanatos, a Greek mythological figure who carries humans off to the underworld when their lives are done. For Thanos, therefore, his name literally means death. I am inevitable. This morning when we get into our text of 18 verses in chapter number 9, you're going to find why God led me to use a simple phrase for a title. Death is inevitable. Death is something that is coming to all men, the Bible says, and you don't even have to be concerned convinced of it by the Bible's side, you and I have been born by God and we have been assigned a day. Very simply, it says up on the screen this, God has created us all equally bound to a day of birth and a day of death. Duh. See, the key thinking in all of this, if you go a little deeper, is, hey, are any of you responsible for the day you came on this earth? You are not. In the day of your death, no, you are not. You say, what about people that are considering taking their own lives? That is a whole nother package, but the bottom line is, if that's the day that God is allowed to be appointed to that person, then that person has taken their free will and executed it upon an incredible, glorious gift, which is the gift of life. Does the Bible teach that someone who has done such a thing is eternally damned if they're born again, if they are saved? The Bible teaches this, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things in heaven, nor things. The, the, the Bible teaches us that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is found in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If you're born again and your life is taken in some form or fashion, whatever it may be, and God says that you're eternally sealed to the day of redemption. Where am I going with this this morning? Ecclesiastes and Solomon mentions a lot about death. And it is a reality. And oftentimes we do well with speaking about our own death, but maybe not speaking about the dead or death in regards to other people or what they may or may not have gone through. From last week's message, I have up on there Ecclesiastes 8.8, 8, which says this, There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death. That goes right back to what I was saying. 
There is no discharge in that war. What is the war? The war is life and death. There's no discharge from this life and death struggle. It is no discharge from the war of this life. God has set this life before you. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. All your thinking goes to, what about wars? What about some of the things that have gone on in my lifetime? What about the things that I've experienced and seen? I'm a military person. I have been called to do things that I never would do. As much as on the other side, I see things that have been done in the wickedness of this world. When it comes right down to it, the statement of what Solomon's saying is, death is inevitable I am inevitable. So it behooves this question, which is up on the screen. Why do we have such a difficult time with the idea of death? Especially when we speak of it to some, about someone else or speak to someone else about it. We might say, hey, my friend, they passed on. My friend, uh, they went to sleep. Um, that my friend, they, they left us, and it's pretty sad, they, they went home. Believers will say, that's the loss, but the believers will say, well, they went home to be with Jesus. That their day of departing this earth and going home to be with Jesus is here, and they are now with the Lord. You see, unregenerated people, really... You're not born again today. You're lost. You don't know Jesus Christ as Savior. Then death really is a scary thing. In fact, it can be something where you're sorting it out and going, gosh, I feel almost foolish. I feel almost uneducated. I feel almost like I'm ignorant over the matter of life and death. I mean, this is a message by the pastor guy this morning. Well, when you see the text, you'll know why. Because we're teaching the Bible we teach the Bible verse by verse by verse, and this is what God has put in his Bible. And Solomon's going to mention death quite a bit because it is inevitable. So why is it that we have such a difficult time talking about death? Just because you've experienced someone very close to you dying, just because death has come into your life, and really is someone very close to you, someone that you love very much, a, a loved one, a close relationship, and so you have maybe experience in that, that area doesn't even mean that you do well with death. Because oftentimes, again, we would do well with, hey, I'm going to die someday. Hallelujah. I'm going to go home to be with the Lord, but a lost person... They don't have eternity to think about. Solomon in this text is saying, hey, under the sun, this life is nothing. It means nothing. Well, apart from Jesus Christ, your life is over when you take your last breath. But the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wait a minute. How do I get eternal life? I've heard that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Perish. Death. Okay, maybe I can warm up to that idea. How in the world do I enter eternity? Well, as my brother Brian spoke of last night, God cannot be in the presence of sin. And sin is not allowed in the presence of God. So God did so love the world that he gave his only begotten son. So that we could believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and for by grace we will be saved through faith. Not of ourselves, you can't do it yourself, but it's the gift of God, not a works list. Any man should boast, and then you start talking about as a believer, hey, I called on the name of the Lord to save me. Something crazy happened. I just feel so different. There's something that's happened. Well, your sins are forgiven. You're redeemed. God sees you through the Son's blood. And now the blood of Jesus Christ has justified you. And now, death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? So we got the doctrine right, but why is it still hard to talk about death, believers? Because it's a serious thing. Anybody flippant about death, to me, 
is not born again. Someone who te- treats death foolishly, ah, oh, when I die, I'm just going to go have a party in hell with all my buddies. Whoa. I used to say that before 1983. Someone showed me that I could have eternal life. I said, there's no way you can have eternal life. i got to take a shot at this, and maybe if I did enough good, it'll offset all the bad, which in my case at that time was impossible. And someone showed me in the Bible that you may know that you have eternal life and you believe in the name of the Son of God. You can know that you can have eternal life and believe in the name of the Son of God. You call on the name of the Lord to save you. You believe in your heart, and now you have eternal life, and you can know for sure, for certain, forever. Now when death comes, hallelujah, I'm in the presence of my holy Savior, Jesus Christ. But I still have a tough time talking about death. How about you? So I put up here this. What is your personal reason? Maybe it's really real. Maybe there's reasons why you don't want to talk about death. People go to visit a, a grave site. I have a really hard time doing that, but I know that it's good to do that sometimes. There's a marker in Blue Springs Cemetery that says Victoria Sherry Brown. And I realize, okay, I know that her body is there, but that her soul, when she gets saved at seven years old, was sealed to the day of redemption. And there was fruit in her life that tells me that she's there in heaven with the Lord. But to speak about that is so hard. But death is inevitable. It is inevitable. And it's interesting that a character in a Marvel comic that is portrayed as the most powerful person in the room (laughs) gets thwarted by the same line. Now this shows you I've watched too many movies. When he says, I am Iron Man. Yeah. I'm with you. I love your kids. They're the best. I hope they put up with me and they really actually know what I'm saying. But the bottom line in all that is, in that whole setting of movies, that's just movies right now, this is the word of God. This is the word of God. 1 Kings chapter number 11 tells us an accounting of Solomon's end. It says in the rest of the Acts of Solomon, all that he did in his wisdom and all that written in the book of the Acts of Solomon... And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers, was buried at the city of his father, excuse me, city of David, his father, and Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his stead. We'll come back to that at the end here today. Solomon slept with his fathers. Even Solomon, he's the big guy in the room. He's the guy that's preaching this message. He's the first king's ruler of the nation of Israel. Even his father didn't reign in Jerusalem as long as he did. He said, well, he was a king for 40 years as well. But he was in Hebron, remember, for seven years. He wasn't in Jerusalem for 40. He was in Jerusalem for 40. He reigned over the nation of Israel and made a mess out of it. After starting really, really well, he made a mess out of it. And now he's at the end of his life as we're looking at Ecclesiastes once again to remind you that he's getting close to the end. And he realizes that death is inevitable. I am inevitable. Charles Spurgeon said this, Never fear dying, beloved. Dying is the last, but the least matter that a Christian has to be anxious about. Fear living. That is a hard battle to fight. A stern discipline to endure. A rough voyage to undergo. Charles Spurgeon, that's hundreds of years ago. Never fear dying, beloved. So that may be the truth for us today. That we can handle ourselves dying. But talking about death is really tough. Watch Solomon preach this message. 
in your Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter number 9, verses 1 through 18. Here's our short devotion on Sunday morning. Here we go. For all this I considered in my heart even to declare all this that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. No man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. Okay, some good declaratives there. All things come alike to all, it says in verse number two. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the clean, and to the unclean, and to him that sacrificeth, and to him that sacrificeth not. As is the good, so is the sinner, and he that sweareth as he that feareth an oath. So basically declaratives of truth and reality. Hey, there's things to the good, there's things to the bad, there's things to the people that sacrifice, there's things to people that do not sacrifice. Now here we are with Solomon drawing a conclusion. In his flesh, under the sun, under the heaven, he says in verse 3, this is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all, yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live after they go to the dead. Our first spot here and stop off these first three verses, I see something that we have seen before, but it bears emphasis because it's in the scriptures. The inescapable brevity of life. It's said often at funerals, I know I have said it in my notes or something, in the, hey, no matter how long someone lives, you wish you had another day, another week, another month with somebody, right? You, you, you wish, you, you hope, you go, boy, I could just have some more time with them. One of the ways in which the sicknesses that have been going on over many, many years, and the latest sickness is that it scares us with the idea that, boy, I could die from it. Right? I mean, I could die from this, I could die from that, I could die for a lot of, from a lot of things. The ine inescapable brevity of life, it just hears Solomon saying, look, look. Verse number two, all things come alike to all. So he's saying, hey, righteous, unrighteous, wicked, clean, unclean. Hey, yeah, everybody has this exposure to good and to bad. We say in verse number four, hey, these things that we consider and Solomon's consider righteous and wise and worse, they're in the hand of God. God takes care of them. Love or hatred. So, so wait a minute now. Does God just favor the good people and he hates all the bad people? Solomon's making a few twists because, again, he's leaving out the eternal holy God under the sun. In man's life and thinking and someone that's lost and in this earth that's saying, hey, there doesn't seem to be much. Everybody does whatever they want. Evil's among all things that are done under the sun. It says in verse number three, come on, evil's everywhere. One event happens to all. We live and then we die. Okay, so we'll just simply in our devotion time this morning go, these three verses, they represent the brevity of life. Okay. Follow along with me. Let's continue to break down the chapter. Verses 4, 5, and 6. It says this. For to him that is joined to all the living there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. Very strange statement there. If you know anything about the Jewish culture in Israel, dogs were... Bleh. Even our chocolate lab would be regarded that way. Now, we have another dog at the house that I would agree with the nation of Israel. You're not ever in second service. You're ruining this whole thing right here right now. But think about it. A, he said a, a, an animal that's alive is better than a dead lion, and that animal that's alive is a dog, which is not regarded as anything good in the Jewish people. Verse number six, excuse me, verse number five, for the living know that they shall die. Death is being mentioned quite a bit here. But the dead know not anything, neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. That was not my fault. I don't even have that kind of ringer. Are you guys messing with me? Are we receiving phone calls through the iMac up there? 
just as I am in. This is not as easy as it looks up here, I tell you. You guys. Where was I before I got rudely? I was talking about death again and dying. Ah! Those computers. Neither have they any more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Real quick, it's simple this. Someone dies. Soul and spirit live on. But a person who's thinking about the body as being only it, you ain't doing anything in that grave. That body ain't coming up out of there. Even if you watch all those whatever shows with the walking people and all that. <laughs> Verse number six. Also their love and their hatred and envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. What does it say up there? Very simply this. Some people just try to get by because they look at things and go, hey, once I get to the grave, I can't do anything. I might as well just get by. I might as well just get through. Life is more than just enduring, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Why have we fallen into that thinking process that, well, I'm saved, I'm born again, and I go to heaven, and I'm just going to endure to the end, and that's going to be okay. There is opportunity for you and me every day to minister the gospel to someone to minister the gospel to a group of people, your community, to go and give something and do something. Be the hands and feet of Christ. If someone's thirsty, give them to drink. Someone who needs to be clothed, clothe them. And after you do that, tell them why you did it. Because they need Jesus Christ as Savior. Life is more than just enduring. I'm just trying to get through. Oh my, what a terrible way to live. Solomon's thinking that way. When you get to the grave, you're done. Woo! If you're lost, you are done. But if you're saved, woo, 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 eternity with Jesus. I don't know what that's going to be, but I can't wait. Yes. Why? Because I'll be in his presence. Soul and spirit, body in the grave. I wouldn't want this to get out of the grave anyway. It's looking bad. And after it goes to the grave, it decays. They got all kinds of chemicals for that. But still, it's a decaying carcass. That's what we are. That's what Solomon's saying. Verse number 7, I'm going to take verse number 7 down through verse number 10. Follow along in our morning devotion together. Go thy way. Eat thy bread with joy. Drink thy wine with a merry heart. For God now accepteth thy works. Let thy garments be always white. Let thy head lack no ointment. That means take care of yourself. Verse number 9, live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity. Watch this now, guys. Watch this, watch this. That's your Valentine's present there, honey. There you go. You're welcome. I'm off the hook for the flowers. I'm off the hook for everything. There you go. Bam. Just using the scriptures. You know, you always want me to use the Bible. Okay. I don't know if that's going to get me through. I don't know. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity. If it's of vanity and it's of nothingness, but he's saying, wait a minute, this life has something more to it. Watch this. For that is thy portion in this life, in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Don't you love that principle? For there is no work, no device, no knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. You better get done what you got to get done because there's coming a day where you can't get nothing done on this earth. It says up here very simply this. There are things to enjoy in life. In Jesus Christ, it's a beautiful life. If you're going to feed your flesh and take glory from God and give the glory to yourself, that's not what Jesus Christ taught us. That's not what the principle is here, even though Solomon is trying to twist it with the idea that this life is all vanity. But when you turn it into a life that's fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're giving him the whole complete honor of things you're respecting what he is going to do you're honoring what he wants to do with you you found your purpose in everything and it's for him then you're looking at it going i want to just enjoy the life i have are you going to have some sufferings yes enjoy them are you going to have some tough times enjoy them are you going to have some difficulties enjoy them it's amazing how when we go through tough times and sufferings at work we want to raise 
Well, I went through so much, I need to get more pay. I'm going through too much, I'm getting, I'm done eating up, I need more pay. Well, what about with the Lord, spiritually speaking? He's already going to give you more pay. Because of the sufferings of this present world. And not to be compared with what we have in glory. It's eternal rewards. It's all up there. It's for his glory. It's life worth living. Because it's not trapped here. It's up there. It's all there. But if all you think is this and your ceiling for life is this high, I feel bad for you. It's time to reject passivity. If you missed that last week. Go listen to it. It's not that good, but maybe you'll get something. Listen, our ceiling needs to be heaven up above with the glorious Savior and Lord. And when I think that way, life is enjoyable. Life is beautiful. You say you've gone through a couple things, a little bit. You have too. So what in the whole scheme of things? Not so what like I don't care. I do care very, very much. I'll listen with you, I will pray with you, I will cry with you, and then we'll keep on going, and we'll do it together, and we won't get like Solomon and say, ah, huh, death is inevitable, who cares? No, I am inevitable, death says. What are you going to do with it? What am I going to do with it? Verses 11 and 12 are pretty cool. They come right together beautifully. I returned and saw unto the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither bread to the wise, nor yet riches to the men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to the small. Now, before I read verse number 12, we say, okay, well, the best team's always going to win. Is that true? The biggest army's always going to win. Is that true? It doesn't mean that you don't war up like that. It doesn't mean you don't go to war with the very best armor of God that you can get your hands on, which is the spiritual armor. Then you get your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You get your loins girt about with truth. You get your breastplate of righteousness. You get your helmet of salvation. You put them on and you go to war. But time and chance happen to them all. Do you know what's going to happen to you tomorrow? The Bible says sufficient of the day is the evil thereof. Life is a vapor, it even appears for a little time and vanishes away. That didn't come out right. Please correct me later. That did not come out right at all. But I look at this thing and I'm thinking, okay, this life is something to enjoy, but also there's something more here. Because in verse number 12 it says, For man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that caught in the snare. So are the sons of men snared at an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. It says up there very simply this. Much of life is unpredictable. Are you going to continue just kind of, okay, I don't know if I, I don't know. No, you prepare well. You prepare. You prepare for everything. You expect anything. And you go to war of life that you don't get discharged from every day prepared. How many of you can attest to the fact and the truth that when you don't spend time in God's word, either the night before or the morning or the night before or the morning or the night before or the morning, and you go a few days like that, oh, the unpredictably, uh, under, unpredictability of that day that's coming before you is not handled the same as if when you were in the word and in the spirit. And you're going, Lord, it's a tough day. It's really hard. But it's okay because I know I can trust in you, Lord, with all my heart. I can still lean on my own. I don't lean on my own understanding. All I always acknowledge him. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear any evil. David wrote that. There's a lot written about death. Again, we finish up our devotion with these last few verses. Watch this. I want you to think about what's going to be up here in a minute. Because there's much of life that's unpredictable in this last five, six verses are, again, back to this wisdom principle. Watch this. Verse number 13. This wisdom have I seen also under the sun. It seemed great unto me. There was a little city and a few men within it. And there came a great king against it, besieged it, and built great bulwarks against it. Think of this as a little parable story by Solomon. It's a great little story. Now there was, in verse number 15... In it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no man remembered that same poor man. Interesting. 
a big king who's very powerful, comes into a city and blasts it. And people tell the story of how bad that day was when the king that came from another place blew something all up. Instead of looking at this poor little man and saying, look at what this little man did. We forget about the widow and her might oftentimes. Verse number 16, 17, 18 say this. Then said I, wisdom is better than strength. I love this. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. The words of wise men are heard and quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. Boy, you ought to memorize that one. The words of wise men are heard and quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. Whew. That's some good stuff right there. It says up there very simply, wisdom in life is a principal thing. Proverbs chapter number 4, verse number 7 says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom with all thy getting. Get understanding. Wisdom still remains the principal thing. We live by the promises of God, right? We've said that before in this study. We don't live by, ah, I wonder what's going to happen, expectations, wonderments, uh, circumstances. We live by the promises of God. He will never leave you nor forsake you when you're a believer in Christ. Again, if you're lost today, you need to consider that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. You need salvation today, soon, because wisdom in life is a principal thing. When I think about how I, death, am inevitable, I think again about, as we bring this to a close, of that simple statement again that Spurgeon said, never fear dying, beloved. Dying is the last but the least matter that a Christian has to be anxious about, fear living. That is a hard battle to fight, a stern discipline to endure, a rough voyage to undergo. The Bible references many things in regards to death. Life, of course, as well. When Ecclesiastes 7.1 says a good name is better than precious ointment, the day of death than the day of one's birth. Hey, I get that. I do. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. I get that. I see. Yeah. But still, grabbing a handle on that for us, we still don't talk through what death really means and what it can be like to walk through this. So let me just give you two that may walk you through this. Next few minutes, and I'll be done. Now maybe, maybe these two things, coming from the word and by the spirit of application that can get us to a place where we do the idea of death a little bit better. That we handle not necessarily like we're some kind of expert by, hey, death is inevitable. Um, I can lightly talk about it. I can even use the word. I have faced death. I have walked through some things with the death of others. And it doesn't mean that I have a greater understanding and I'm an expert, but rather that it's worth talking through things when someone passes away, when someone dies. Because we know the scriptures often, we forget that, spiritually speaking, that we're to die to ourselves. The Bible teaches that. And that's where, again, spiritual principles, personally talking about that's one thing, but being able to handle the idea of death sometimes can be really, really, really tough. First one is you go to 1 Kings chapter number 11. Join me at 1 Kings. I'll put the first one up here. Death is inevitable. Now, you know, I really, this is the hardest part of me preparing the message is trying to find words that mess you up a little bit. Just kidding. The certainty of death necessitates our excuse me our respectability so think for a minute the certainty of death as we spoke of in our devotion for the last few minutes after our introduction 
and we're finishing up right here, and necessitates our respectability of God's sovereignty. So you think for a minute. The certainty of death, it's coming, it's true, it's real for all of us, it's inevitable. But it necessitates our respectability of God's sovereignty. We've mentioned God's sovereignty in our study once or twice over the last few months. Consider this for a moment. As the certainty of death comes to each one of us, we realize that God is still over everything. God still is in charge of everything. The certainty of death has got to wake us up possibly because some of us believers have forgotten that God's sovereignty is over everything. I think that you and I somehow, some way, just think, oh, God somehow forgot me. God somehow forgot to keep everything together. Oh, God didn't know that all these things were coming. You say, well, you've said that before, Pastor. Yeah, but the point is that even in our study in Ecclesiastes and oftentimes in the Word of God, you see God repeat things, repeat things, because I'm not so sure we get a handle on things properly. Respectability of God's sovereignty. Maybe the certainty of death will have you consider God is over everything. He is the one that's not surprised by anything. He is sovereign. He owns everybody and everything and every single dollar that you've ever thought about earning. He owns every piece of property. He owns every person. And whether or not you and I want to believe that, sometimes the certainty of death will necessitate our respectability of that. Why do I say that? Look at Solomon's life. Join me in 1 Kings chapter number, nine, chapter number 11, verse 9. I will just read this simply. It speaks for itself. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. God is sovereign. He has a right to be angry anytime he wants to be angry. God does not sin. The Bible teaches us. Be angry and sin not. God has never sinned, but the Lord was angry with Solomon. We continue in verse 10. And had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore, the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant." At that point, I'll be going, yeah, sure, he deserves that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, really? Oh, really? You see, this is personal for every one of us, so the hour can turn into your. But the certainty of death necessitates your respectability of God's sovereignty. Because aren't you thankful for God's grace as well? God's sovereignty over all of it says in verse 12 and 13, Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake and for Jerusalem's sake which I have chosen. God is already determining the division of the kingdoms even before Solomon's about to have his last breath in this earth. And his son Rehoboam, and Jeroboam, who is contesting against the throne, they're going to be the leaders of the divided kingdom when he gets started here. What is God doing here? Showing his sovereignty. And you and I, in the certainty, in the reality of death, it ought to necessitate us to be a more aware of and more respectable and more respective of God's sovereignty he is the God of the universe. The second and last thing I have in terms of application that may make you see that death being inevitable can spur some things on. The unpredictability of life. After I talked about the certainty of death, the unpredictability of life necessitates our acceptability of God's immutability. I'm still in 1 Kings. I'll be there in a second. Just, just, just grab that. Life is unpredictable. And it necessitates you and I to accept that God's never going to change. 
But when tomorrow comes and things don't go your way, you want God to change himself to be your biggest fan and do something for you that's against his word. His word is unchanging and he's unchanging. That's what the word immutable means. He is immutable and you must accept the fact that God's not going to change. That'll help you. Well, how does that fit with the message here? Because death being inevitable might cause you to go, wait a minute. Whew! The unpredictability of life necessitates me to accept that God is not changing. But in God not changing, he's still gracious. Aren't you glad? He's still faithful. Aren't you glad? He's omniscient. Um, no, he knows everything. He is kind. He is gentle. He is good. See, I'm not talking about all the bad stuff. I'm talking about the fact that God is immutable. And all those things you love about him are real. But the other side of it is that God might do something about something. 1 Kings chapter number 11. Watch this. Verse number 14, 23 and 26. And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad, the Edomite. He was of the king's seed in Edom. What was he doing that for? He's stirring up an adversary. God's always wanting to redeem something. God's always wanting to have someone be reconciled. God's always wanting someone in the midst of his punishment and judgment to turn around but we see that Solomon hasn't. So verse number 23. And God stirred him up another adversary. Rezon, the son of Elida, which held from his lord, had Xezer, king of Zobah. Another adversary God brought. The unpredictability of life necessitates our acceptability of God's immutability. What's he doing it for? To get Solomon to come back to him. God will use grace. God will use mercy. God will use some places of stirring up an adversary because God's will still has to be fulfilled. Sovereignty and immutability. Verse number 26 up there. And Jeroboam the son of Nabat, an Ephraimite an Ephr of Zerida, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow woman. Even he lifted up his hand against the king. You see, the unpredictability of life. Solomon didn't know this was happening. And it necessitates our acceptability of God's immutability. God's not changing. God has to have things just and right. What is he going to do with it? We find out later on that from reading earlier in our message that Solomon's life was over rather shortly after this. So how do we conclude? We conclude by this. In our prayer time, maybe today, you will consider that life has only so many breaths and so many beats. So maybe the question that you can work through today in our invitation time, maybe at your tables, maybe later after service you want to come up and visit. The inevitability of death, to me, would cause me to make a little deeper dive. So what sort of deep dive will you commit to to really know who God is? God's immutability, God's sovereignty, Death is inevitable. What are you going to do with the idea that, hey, life only has a few breaths. Life only has a few beats. What will I do in the midst of knowing that life will come to an end? May I use it for the glory of God and fulfill the purpose he's called me to in Jesus' name. Why don't you please stand with me? I'm going to pray.